The Moton Mailbag is brought to you by the Robert Russo Moton Museum, located in Farmville, Virginia. The Moton Museum is a civil rights museum focusing on the history of Prince Edward County between 1951 and 1964. My name is Kanan Townsend, Director of Education and Public Programs at the Robert Russo Moton Museum, and welcome back to the Moton Mailbag. And I'm Leah Brown, the Assistant Director of Education. The Moton Mailbag is a weekly listener question show. Each week we'll answer questions about U.S. history, African American culture, civil rights, and more. Feel free to submit your questions via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moton Museum, or you can just email us at info at MotonMuseum.org. So, Leah, mm-hmm. how was life? How was COVID? How was everything? It's going, you know? We're just trying to make the best of a bad situation. Yep. And that's, that's where I am. What's your your new favorite quarantine activity? Planning trips. Plan one this morning. <laughs> I mean, so that long, that long pause, like boredom. Boredom is my new yeah, favorite activity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, cause like you can only clean, but so much. Yep. Because if it's already clean, you just waste the product at that point. Yep. Um, like Netflix a lot on Netflix. Nice. Big Mug and Hulu, you know, just branching out. <laughs> streaming services that's where i am you know yeah it's it's yeah you can only i, I can only binge my favorite show so many times before mm-hmm. i'm going crazy and need mm-hmm. something else give me something let us go outside please 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 please, please. soon um oh yeah when, when it's appropriate when it's appropriate yeah i thought about buying a glider for in front of my house which i'm not going to but i thought about it real hard a glider yeah it's kind of like a swing for old people like me Swing. You just like scoot, scoot, scoot back and forth. Is it that's like the moving chair with the moving stool part? No. Or is that something different? <laughs> no. I think we had one for my kid. Like, but I, don't, I thought it was called a glider, but maybe that's I mean, probably else. it's probably a variations on the theme. It's like a rocker, but like it has a stool yeah. part, and that part also rocks. So, so it, it limits it the range of motion. But yeah, you just scooch back and forth. Wow. Well, yeah. I have thought about <laughs> purchasing. A lot of dumb stuff, but I don't want to raise Amazon stock anymore, so I'm yeah. gonna I'm cooling it. <laughs> I did the whole like, oh, let's let's spend money, and then it's like, no, nope, let's not, because yeah, then I look, you may get it in May. Why would I give you money now? Let's save. Let's all but, save. You know. <laughs> yeah. Let's all save. Um, well, thank you to those who <laughs> uh, sent in your questions. I mean, if that's something I want to comment on this with, like, what are kind of things that y'all doing? What oh, activities, yeah. you know, what weird purchases do you have to make? Like, what are your stores missing because everybody's buying them in bulk? Like, tweet at us, Facebook, Instagram. Do you have any new hobbies? Please help us. <laughs> and it's interesting. We just want to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple questions for you all. Thanks for those who did send them. Please keep sending in your questions because that's how we keep this thing going. Um, but we've got, you know, three, four questions that we're going to ask and, and chat about here today. If Leah, are you ready to get started? I am ready. You are ready. All right. Let's start with question number one. Unsung heroes of the civil rights movement. And let me preface, for the purpose of this, let's let, let's quantify what the, civil, the time period of the civil rights mm. movement. Uh, let's say, for art museum purposes, not, let's say... 1951 to 1968. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Is that... That's a good range. I think in terms of what we're... How we're defining it. Of course, there was stuff after that. But, like, I think 68 was what? Fair Housing Act? And that was, like, the last... Not the last, but the last kind of in that time period, like, major kind of civil rights legislation. That sounds right. I don't Fair know Housing... Saying. Affordable Housing Act? Something, something, something like that. Something. But I think that 17-year span is probably a good honing in point because definitely people in the nation have been fighting for rights oh, yeah. since the nation started and before that so it's nice to have a little like this is their time frame you want to go first i thought you were going first i can go first <laughs> <laughs> um I, I so my answer was is, is a kind of a cop-out answer but i do have a specific answer as well but i said any woman um i don't think any woman in the movement get nearly as much credit as they have earned as they deserved and that reflects the amount of work that that women put in during that time period um 
you know, I, I think for a local example, I, I gave Adelaide Griffin, who was the wife of uh, Reverend L. Francis Griffin. You know, I, I don't think he gets talked about enough, but certainly I don't think that she gets gets talked about enough for for everything that she has 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 done. And I don't mean only like the first first ladies of the civil rights movement. I mean people people really on the front lines, people really doing the work, and and those support roles as well. Um, I don't think we talk about women enough in history in general. Agreed, absolutely, one hundred percent. We need to really work on 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 doing better, but you know, that's that's a process, and we are working about, and that's why, and, that, and that's why it's so special. I think for me, working at Moton, where a, a big kind of catalyst of our story is a sixteen-year-old African American female, Barbara Ruth Johns. Um, but yeah, I think in general, all women, you know, unless it's Rosa, right? People aren't really talking about women from the civil rights movement, even when like, you know, so the Rosa Parks Montgomery bus boycott that was planned, but you know, eight months, nine months before that, there was another girl, Claudette Colvin, who got arrested on the bus for doing the same thing. Like she just get talked about really, you know, widely, you know, there's just so much more room to talk about women who are part of the movement. Absolutely. I just finished, um, lighting the fires of freedom, African American women in the civil rights movement. Nice. Yeah, so that's a beautiful segue. Um, so it kind of, you talked about Gloria Richardson, Leah Chase, who I, oh my gosh, she's amazing to me. I'm in awe of her. Was like one of the women profiled in what she did. Like she was the chef. She has passed away. Not just because you have the same first name. Yeah, well, that helped. <laughs> but also, <laughs> but also, um, like she was from New Orleans and her husband's family's restaurant, Dookie Chase, she was like, we're going to have high quality um, restaurant experience for African Americans. Again, limited to like African Americans, they couldn't eat in restaurants. Right. So to have an actual experience is a big deal. And then like she fed all the civil rights leaders. They just were like, oh, hey, come on in. She'd have food ready for them. So, you know, just stories like that. I just have a lot, of, a lot of emotion and feelings about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I Actually, who I picked was Ella Baker. She nice. um, was part of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Conference Council, one of them, SELC. <laughs> but she also inspired students with SNCC, mm-hmm. the Student Nonviolent. Of course, the letters are escaping. Coordinating right. committee. Thank you. <laughs> No um, worries. Alphabet soup. Yeah, yeah. Her mentality was anybody and everybody can and should protest to give the people the tools to stand up for themselves. Um, she actually, this is new to me. I recently found this out. She was the NAACP um, field secretary. Nice. So she would go and ask people to sign up to be part of the NAACP in the Deep South, but it was dangerous to have the political affiliation. So it was kind of like advocating for our communities within that community, but also realizing that it was a danger to it. Right. Um, so her big thing was grassroots to give the people the power to help themselves. You know, and don't depend on a particular leader, but everybody can has a voice and they can use it. So yeah, she's, she's up there for me. You know, this will be an interesting conversation to come back to because this would be 30 minutes, but like, Talking about like the women, the the clash of the the black movement and the women's movement, um, yeah. the numerous numerous clashes and how often the women's movement got put on the back burner. Um, heck, today still kind of does. I feel like um, I feel like it gets put on on the back burner. But that, I think that's a, just an interesting topic that we can talk about yeah. at a that's later a date because we could be here for an hour talking <laughs> about that, um, and we could be here an hour talking about this next question too. Okay, so question two. Does racism still exist? Don't take your headphones out. Don't stop listening. Don't pause. It's okay. We're going to break this down. Mm -hmm. This is a big question. We could spend the whole episode talking about this, and we have plenty of time to do that, so that's okay. Let's take a deep breath. We're going to be okay. We're going to go through this. Mm -hmm. Short answer, yes. Absolutely, yes. But we want to, for the purpose of this conversation going forward, we want to have some definitions. And there's no... There's a lot of definitions out there, but we just went with Marion Webster just so we can all be sort of on the same page. And so there are four terms we wanted to find just for the sake of the conversation going forward. Racism 
bias, discrimination, and prejudice. There are nuances that make all four of those terms different, but there is certainly overlap, but they often get used interchangeably, but they are not exactly the same. Um, sort of like equality and equity, right? Mm. Not exactly the same. There are some pretty significant differences. So let's start with the word that's in the question. Racism. A belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. And I'm going to add a word in there that was initially in there. What is race, right? Race is, is, is a social construct. It's not real, but it has real consequences. Mm -hmm. It's not scientific. It's not medical. It's not found in any, any you know, any significant research or, well, it does have research, but like it's not, uh, you know, anthropology. It's, it's purely observational. You look like this, so I'm putting you in this category. It's different from e ethnicity. Absolutely. And, and because eth ethnicity is related to culture, it's, it is scientific, it is medical, it is, it is certainly common traits, but it's, it's more scientific, right? So I am black and I'm African-American. Black is race, African-American is culture, ethnicity, right? You know, you can be black and you can be German. You can be black and French. You can be black and Dutch. You can be black and Brazilian. You can be black and Spanish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not the same thing. Many folks who I've seen here who come, especially to play sports, uh, for local college here, Longwood, you know, I'm from the UK, you know, black guy from the UK, you know, like, oh yeah, you're African American. He's like, I'm what? I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm British. Mm -hmm. Like I'm black and British. Right. So there's the kind of, what's the difference between race and ethnicity? Um, let's go into bias. Definition of bias. I have an inclination of temperament or outlook, especially a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. Prejudice can kind of sometimes tie into that bias part as well. Let's go to discrimination. A prejudice or prejudicial outlook action or treatment example is racial discrimination the second definition the act practice or an instance of discriminating categorically rather than individually and then the last definition prejudice injury or damage resulting from some judgment or action of another in disregard of one's rights especially detriment to one's legal rights or claims Right, so there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of words that may be in all of those definitions. However, they 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 are different. Um, for 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 what racism is is systemic, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big broad spectrum. It's a big broad conversation we'd have to have around it. Uh, I think Lee and I both feel like you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, I'm not I'm not racist if I'm not in a hate group, um, or hate organization, or a supremacy group. But I think it's more important to think about racism as a spectrum rather than a are you, aren't you. And I think that's kind of that dichotomous way of thinking that we usually have. I, either I am or I'm not, right? The supporting policies that, you know, overwhelmingly discriminate against people of color, right, which, I could, which you would consider a racist policy, right, if they're being disproportionately affected, you know, is supporting a policy that is, is a racist policy, does that make you racist? I don't think it's that simple, but I think that's a conversation worth, worth having. I mean, it's about power structures as well, like systemic, how infrastructures, systems are built. Sometimes are built with racist, racialized intentions. Right. Racialized intentions means a particular group, which is limited or what they could do is change just based upon an unreal perceived concept because race itself is not real. Um, so you have that dynamic, and then depending on like ethnicity, like somebody's cultural identity, depending on what that is, that could change, or they could be limited because of racialized systems. So it's it's a can of worms and a half, but it definitely still exists and it has direct impact on people, on citizens, American citizens, every single day. Very recently, and it's, and it's really good that you brought that you said what you said in terms of systemic, um, uh, systemic oppression, systemic racism. Is that the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, recently just ruled it was a six to three split decision, uh, but they ruled to overturn laws that were in, let's say, Oregon. There were some there were some states that essentially the, the hung jury, right? They they passed laws in the early twentieth century to basically you don't have to have a, a unanimous jury to commit convict somebody of a crime and essentially those laws are put 
in place specifically to because they couldn't like not consider black jurors they put those laws into place to make sure that black jurors if they were on juries they wouldn't their vote wouldn't matter mm -hmm. so you could have a split jury like a nine to three or you know ten to two whatever jury and you could convict whoever you wanted to convict without considering them so the supreme court ruled to overturn their law to say that they have to you know because the law was put in place specifically to discriminate against african americans uh and black people you know that they had to they had to flip that they had to, to overturn that law um which is which is really really interesting but i think in terms of racism I mean, you have to look at the system you have to look at you know when it was put in place why it was put in place how it was put in place nothing's really done by by accident um if you haven't seen a good documentary i rep recommend on uh netflix i mean the 13th right um i think it's very very important to look at read the 13th amendment just go read it and you'll understand the the seeds that eventually was brought into the big tree that is the prison industrial complex uh, that has many many more people of co color per capita than there are people of color in the country per capita um, percentage wise you know I, I think we have to have that conversation um, so so yes I mean I think people are starting to take more notice of it I think in Virginia fairly recently there was a a task force uh, through the attorney general's office to remove kind of those Jim Crow remnants from our, our state legal code. Um, we weren't enforcing them, but like they were still on file. Uh, and so in theory, somebody could have enforced it. So they was, you know, they read through all the code and they got rid of all that, you know, Jim Crow uh, type, type language. Um, it certainly still exists. I mean, I think that's the, that's the big thing. As long as there are people, there, there will be racism. However, I think in terms of combating racism, um, it's about educating yourself and others. It's about getting out and meeting people who are different than you and just, and just being open-minded. Um, again, think of racism as a spectrum, not either you are or you're not. I mean, I'm sure everybody has racist tendencies in some capacity. I'm not calling anybody specifically a racist. I'm just saying in some capacity. However, we can do our best to combat those and to educate ourselves and educate others. And part of that is holding people accountable um, people will say different terms. It's like, oh, well, what did you mean by that? Why did you pick that word? All the words in the English language, this is the one you went with? So, you know, being comfortable, being uncomfortable to address it when it happens. You gotta be brave, but you gotta do it. It helps. Uh, I think, yeah, accountability is huge. Um, accountability is huge. Don't, it, it's a, it's a, confrontation is a scary thing. But I think if you come at it from a place of what did you mean by that, as opposed to you're a terrible person, yeah. you know, then that can go a long way. Delivery. Because um, that's happened to me multiple, I mean, multiple times. You know, I was in, uh, uh, I'll give an example. So I was in, I was leading a session. Um, uh, I was at a, con a conference presentation and I was talking about race and museums. Uh, and uh, one of the participants said, oh yeah, I meant, you know, something, something, something. This one lady, and she was, she used the word oriental. Um, mm. and so we, and I had, you know, I did not, you know, lambast or anything like that, but we had to, you know, I, I waited until the situation was at a point where I could go and just like, Hey, just so you know, I mean, we, and I'm not trying to be, you know, it's not about being PC police or anything like that, but like it just, that word is, is offensive to many. Uh, and, and, and here's a more, you know, appropriate term that you could maybe use to describe who you were, who you were talking about. Um. You know, it was as simple as that. And she was very, very appreciative because, you know, she probably used that word fairly, not often, but whenever she saw a person of Asian descent, she probably used that word. Um, and so it was a matter of like, hey, look, like, I know you didn't mean anything by it. I could tell by the way that you said it. However, here's, you know, a better word maybe to use towards those populations. Anything else on that one? It's a heavy one. Yeah, it's very heavy. It's a... Uh, but important. It's a hard conversation to have, it's, but it's very, very important. Um, because it helps inform how American society is, you know. As a historian, I've seen it, I've seen how it was built, how it was put in place, the laws that supported it, how the persistent persecution and terror tactics. I mean, it's yeah. it's part of the American story, and to not talk about it, it's doing a disservice. Absolutely, a disservice. One of my favorite quotes is racism racism is is as American as apple pie. Mm. I mean it's Yep. Or or baseball well. or, or you know. It, 
it is what it is. But yeah. we have to do what we can to combat and continue to try to progress. Because yeah. if you don't address it, how? if you don't know it's a problem and don't say it's a problem, it's not a problem until it absolutely positively is. But pretty clear it's a problem yeah. or an issue. And, and I think if, if you're not, I think another note, like if you're not impacted by racism, I mean, it's hard to see, right? Like yeah. that's the big thing. You know, how can... You know, we all are a product of our own environment, our own circumstances, and our own, you know, place in this world. You know, so let's just trust people, right? Like, if they say Absolutely. that something's happening, yes. like, believe them until they give a reason not to. Um, because it, it's so difficult, like, oh, how could they have this experience? Like, I've met this person. I've never had a bad experience with them. But, like, it's it's different, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. not the same. Um whether, you know, whether it's law enforcement or education or health, you know, health, like we have the statistics, we have the yes. numbers, we have the facts to show, even with coronavirus. I mean, I don't, I didn't intend to get down this rabbit hole, but like then it's disproportionately impacting people of color, mm -hmm. which people of color are not the majority of people in this country. Right. Like and that. Here we are. That's at least back in the question. Why is that? Um, and it goes to a broader, broader, broader answer. But like that's at least like, yeah, why is why are 100 percent of the cases in this city? african-americans and they're not only african-americans in the city hmm. and then to go back to your point of believing a person absolutely if somebody trusts you enough to be vulnerable and say this is hurting me you don't get to say it does not hurt them because they are a person they know their feelings and their emotions just listen that's the first step just listening yep that got yeah. heavy but that's okay because it was an important question yeah it's an honest question Relevant. I think we've got time for one more. Okay. You ready? Do you want to ask that or you want me to ask? I'll ask it. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite state to visit? Yeah, talk about a change in uh, yeah. the pace. <laughs> <It's> like, um, <laughs> yeah, this we didn't, is the cool down portion. We, yeah, we wanted to end on you know, a bit of a light note. Um, my favorite place to visit. So we're located in Virginia, which I love Virginia. You can't throw a rock uh, in any direction without hitting something historic in Virginia, Virginia history-wise or U.S. history-wise. Yeah. Um, but I can't pick Virginia because I live here. So my favorite <laughs> state to visit, honestly, is, is probably New York State. Um, now, I, I, I looked at this question under the premise of, you know, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. Um, and I would not want to live in New York. However, I would love to, I love to visit New York. I've visited on multiple occasions. The food, the culture... The people, I mean, I'm, a, I'm kind of an introvert, so I don't like being around big crowds, but, you know, I, I could deal with it if it, I could go to, you know, Madison Square Gardens or uh, when I went, I was on Letterman. I got to be on Letterman, which was really cool. You know, like there's this, and that's just the city, but like the whole state in general, I mean, there's so much cool stuff, whether in New York or Buffalo or, or Albany or wherever. Uh, it's just a really nice state and it's got a bunch of stuff to do. Yeah, I just love New York. I love New York. What about you, Leah? I'm going to say North Carolina. Um, I lived there for two years, hence, you know, with NC State and Raleigh. I love Raleigh. Uh, it's like a second home. My, I have family throughout North Carolina, so if I needed to be like, hey, I'm coming down, I'd know I have a couple places I can stay. I love the Outer Banks. That was the trip Outer I planned Banks. this morning. Like, yes. when I can get there, <laughs> please. Um, so, yeah, every region of North Carolina, I have pretty good memories. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my favorite spot to visit. And, and, and geography wise, we can go to plenty of big places in North Carolina quicker than we can get to many other places in Virginia. Yes. Two hours from Durham. <laughs> We're that's in the great. heart of Virginia, you know, two hours from Durham. <laughs> what would that be? Two and a half from Raleigh? Something like that? Yes. Two and a half. Like it'd be five hours, it'd be five hours to get to Bristol. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's or three hours to Northern Virginia. Like, yeah, no, I can, yeah. I can take a ride to that's North Carolina. Oh, man. <laughs> so, I guess that about wraps it up for this week, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's noon. I was wondering. I was like, what jump. on earth? I was like, <laughs> what is that sound? Sorry, the church bells are in the background. I was like, oh, man, I hope the, the mics can't pick it up. But they're pretty system, so they might. So, that concludes our episode this week for the Moten Mailbag. Next week, Monday, same time, same place. Check your podcast feed. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google uh, Play Store. I think that's what that's called. And anchor.com. Uh, just look at the vote mail bag. Please keep sending in your questions, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or email us at info at milkmuseum.org. And that's it for this week. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. The 
The Moton Mailbag is brought to you by the Robert Russo Moton Museum, located in Farmville, Virginia. The Moton Museum is a civil rights museum focusing on the history of Prince Edward County between 1951 and 1964.